Sure. It's one of the questions we get most commonly in clinic, and it is really important for patients. You know, we often think of prognosis at diagnosis. Um, you know, how likely am I to be cured? But as the disease goes along, we actually learn a lot more about it in terms of how it responds to treatment. And it can become increasingly hard to tell someone at this point um, how, how much longer they're likely to live. And we really rely on clinical trials, um, but clinical trials include, you know, a large number of patients um, who, you know, are selected to be well enough to go into the clinical trial. So there's that caveat. Um, and they also often can't keep up with how practice is changing. So a clinical trial that reports out today was designed, um, you know, years ago. And so what the patient in front of me has been through, which treatments they've had could look different. So it's very challenging for a clinician in a room with a patient to look at this patient at this point in time and say, you know, well, you're likely to live X amount of time. And, and patients really are often making significant decisions. You know, some of them are financial, like, do I start dipping into retirement? Um, other are social, like, should I prioritize going on this trip? Should I work a little bit longer um, or retire now? So these are things that when they have a more accurate sense of prognosis, they're able to make better informed decisions. So the original um, prognostic model was from a trial of patients with MCRPC who were randomly assigned to docetaxel with bevacizumab or docetaxel alone. Speaking to that point of, um, first of all, you know, is this patient in front of me someone who would have gotten into the trial? You know, you have to look at the inclusion exclusion criteria, which is a nuance that really doesn't often happen in, in busy clinical practice. But um, also trying to figure out, is this patient likely to be one of the ones that does better or worse with this treatment? So um, Susan Halliby and colleagues drilled down on some of the clinical variables um, that over time have been sort of shown in, in different settings to be important in helping us understand, is this patient you know, in a more serious situation than the other one? And so those are LDH, uh, which is you know, a marker of death of tissue. So we all have LDH, our tissues are always dying and, and being uh, reproduced and healed, but at a relatively slow rate, cancer is growing so quickly that some of it is dying. So when it's growing very quickly, you see elevations in LDH. Um, also alkaline phosphatase, which we know is a marker of activity in the bone, which is really important in prostate cancer. PSA, which is our main tumor marker, um, albumin and hemoglobin. So albumin reflecting maybe nutritional status and hemoglobin bone marrow function, um, which when there's extensive bony involvement can be compromised. Um, also pain, specifically opioid analgesic use and um, performance status. So, you know, whether this patient is able to get dressed, get out of the house, um, are they spending most of their time in bed or not? Those things really give us important information about the how, how much toll the cancer has taken. So those were the variables that were identified in the original model. Now, um, Halaby and colleagues have said, well, you know, we, when 90401 was being done, we didn't have abiraterone and zalutamide, all these modern, very powerful hormonal therapies. What can we tell an MCRPC patient about their prognosis in this newer treatment landscape? So they updated using, um, I think it was seven different trials uh, with uh, docetaxel or with enzalutamide or abiraterone. So this um, new update uh, tells us that these same variables are still helpful, uh, even when uh, we're applying them in this in an updated era. Um, still not completely modern, obviously, but. Um, it, it's important that those variables remain um, predictive. Um, although, you know, one of the 
main drawbacks is that a lot of clinicians don't check LDH. It's not like a part of our routine panels. Uh, so that's one limitation of, of applying this. Um, but otherwise, um, they've shown that these, these variables, uh, if you have three or more high risk variables, then your survival is considerably shorter than if you have fewer. And so you can go online as a clinician, plug in a patient's variables um, or benchmark and, and get a sense of for this patient, are they more or less likely to be alive in you know, two years, which can be helpful. It seems like a lot of the work that's being done to incorporate genomic prognostication is really in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. Um, so I'm not sure, again, I think in the later settings, um, I, I'm not sure that the genomics maybe tell us as much as earlier on. So I think within the next couple of years, we could potentially see genomic information incorporated into hormone sensitive, but castration resistant, I think, um, may, may be slower. I think making it available publicly and online is the most important step to getting it to be used. Um, these types of tools are available for a number of different settings um, across cancers. You know, what's my likelihood of cure after surgery if I have this size tumor and this grade? You know, there, there are these things that empower patients really to be able to um, go online and, and get a sense what their five-year cure rate is. Um, so the fact that Halaby and colleagues have put this available online is really helpful. Um, then it, it really just takes, I guess, um, clinicians uh, giving it a try, um, you know, using it in their day-to-day -day practice to see how it's helpful in addressing their patients' needs, um, you know, telling them a median survival, I think, can be less helpful than, or a median survival prolongation from doing a specific treatment is maybe less helpful than telling them, you know, they have, you know, a 5% chance of being alive in five years versus a 40% chance, you know, that's a big difference. Um, and some of the utilization uh, barrier is that comfort with being able to talk about these very hard things. So I think it, it, it can mostly happen when the patients feel empowered to ask these questions um, and, and ask their clinicians to, to do better than we currently do, which um, is, you know, based on our own experience, you know, let's we should increasingly try when the patient asks us the question to go use the formal prognostic model to try to get them more accurate answers. Um, but it, it won't always come down to the clinician unless the models get exceptionally complicated where it's not patient friendly. You know, these are tools that ultimately, um, I think could be distributed more broadly so that patients can go in and say, okay, I've had these treatments. I've, here are my current labs, which many of them are savvy enough to, to actually be able to plug in and then get a sense of where they're at. Um, I don't know if everyone feels that should be uh, available to patients. I mean, contextualizing it is so important, um, reminding them that they, you know, these are just data from trials that were done and they what they have available to them may be different than what was available to those patients. They may be in better shape than those patients. So uh, maybe uh, it's better done in the context of a discussion with the clinician who can um, take the sting off of seeing those, those um, numbers just, you know, black and white, but, um, you know, so something to think about whether we, we, we want more and more for this to be, um, something patients can access. And I think it just will need to be increasingly iterative. Um, you know, okay, if you get this treatment and that treatment, you know, a little bit more specific 
uh, which it was uh, this was a step in that direction that that um, this paper took by looking at different treatments, right, chemos and more modern hormone therapies. And then the next generation will have to look at some of our other treatments like lutetium PSMA, right, got approved last year. Thank you.